Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Dr. Will Neese Jasmine, the Medical Director for Behavioral Health for the City of Chicago. Dr. Jasmine is a preventive medicine physician who recently graduated from Johns Hopkins. We speak about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on mental health and substance use in Chicago, including the rapidly escalating opioid crisis. Let's listen. Dr. Jasmine, thank you so much for joining me. Can you explain what your job is at the City of Chicago's Health Department? Yes, thank you for having me today. Uh, So I'm a family medicine and preventive medicine physician, and I work as the medical director of behavioral health um, here at the Chicago Department of Public Health. In the Behavioral Health Bureau, uh, we have three main programs. One focuses on violence prevention. Um, The second one focuses on substance use and recovery. And finally, the third is our mental health division. Got it. So have you been involved in the COVID response in Chicago? Oh, yes. Um, Very early on, we've been involved. Um, Actually, a lot of the focus had been on responding to our COVID response, but also the Behavioral Health Bureau is one of the few bureaus that actually remained open during the response. So I had to wear multiple hats for the past few months. I imagine that the COVID pandemic has caused mental health challenges in Chicago. Yeah, so that's something that we recognized early on as well, uh, that this could be a source of stress. So there were many ordinances that were passed that required people to stay home if they uh, were able to. Another source of stress would be that because a lot of the businesses were closed, we saw that there were people who lost their jobs and finding a way to sustain their expenses was also another source of stress. And how did that manifest itself in the mental health arena? Yeah, so so one of my responsibilities in our COVID response was working with our isolation facilities And we found that um, when people were isolating while they were infectious, uh, it was very hard on them because they um, lacked the connection with others and they found that to be very stressful. And so we needed to provide some behavioral health therapy to help them cope with all of the stress. And you did that right there in the isolation facility? Yes. So a lot of it was provided through the telephone. Um, so we were able to talk to, talk to we call them clients, um, who were at, in the isolation facilities. I'm going to ask you about two different groups of people. The first are people with pre-existing mental health conditions. So maybe they had depression or anxiety beforehand. And the second group would be people who really didn't. Um, have a diagnosed mental illness beforehand. Starting with the first one, what did you see among people who were, you know, already in care, already getting treatment? What were the issues for them? Yeah, so even those who were stable and under normal circumstances were coping well um, with their um, psychiatric condition. Um, When you add the stress from all the changes that were made due to COVID that seemed to cause a flare up of their condition. And so what we did was work with a a local um, healthcare provider group to provide telehealth services to those individuals. And so they would provide the care through video conferencing or even over the phone um, through FaceChat. So give me a sense of how many people needed 
telehealth services you had to switch on really quickly? Mm -hmm. Roughly about maybe 30 to 40% of those individuals that we knew had reported to us that they already came with a psychiatric condition. And how many people is that? Dozens, hundreds, thousands? I would say dozens of people. So one of the few surprises, too, in working with the isolation housing group was that uh, oftentimes uh, many people felt safe to isolate at home. So they didn't really take us up on our offer to provide housing. I got it. So dozens of people in the isolation housing, but across the city, probably more. Yes, yes. So across the city, we would think probably in the hundreds or even thousands. So we've set up a website to make sure that those who don't already have a psychiatric provider or therapist, that they can actually contact um, one of our one of the five um, health department run mental health clinics to receive those services. And so for this, this other group, people who didn't have diagnosed mental health conditions, what were the kinds of things that you've started to see? I imagine anxiety is on the list. Yes. So that was the number one thing that we saw. So we helped, our therapists help individuals cope. So find ways to manage the stress. Um, It could be through meditation or um, having them do writing exercises and then checking back on them. Sometimes the source of stress may have been worrying about their family members who were at home without them. So making sure that they were able to stay in contact with their family members by phone. And if there were other issues like having access to food for the family members, we provided those kinds of supports too. So the anxiety was around specific things that maybe you could actually help with. You could get rid of the source of anxiety. Yeah, so that was the key with just speaking to the individual and then finding out why they were worried and why they were anxious. Now, you also have responsibilities around substance use. Is that right? Yes, that's true. So with our substance use and recovery program, uh, we have been working uh, mainly in the uh, addressing the opioid crisis here in Chicago. Chicago has had a long standing history of people who have been dealing with using opioids over 30 to 40 years. But it wasn't until 2015 that we saw a large major uptick in the number of overdoses and deaths from overdoses in the city. Given the surge in overdoses and now the pandemic, how have you been able to respond to the needs of of people in Chicago? and, And what's your sense of the impact of the pandemic on the overdose crisis? Yeah. So what we had previously been tracking like overdoses and deaths on a yearly basis, but beginning this year, we're tracking um, more timely. So every month now, and we are able to notice that at least for the first half of the year, there's a 50% increase in overdoses in the city. And so some of the things that we're doing to try to to address this issue is... Did, did you just say a 50% increase? 50% increase, yes. And so what are the numbers there that you're looking at? Like how many? Yeah, so between January and June 2020, there were 7,301 opioid-related overdoses that EMS uh, workers had responded to. And that's a 60% increase from the previous time, um, previous first half of last year. And then for, it is, it is, no problem. Um, And then we're also looking at deaths through our medical examiner. And we saw that there are 573 deaths so far related to opioid overdoses. And that represents a 55% increase. That's a staggering increase. Initially, we were being asked if this could be related to the COVID pandemic, but we saw this increase um, even beginning in January before the first known cases were here in um, Chicago or even the U.S. What do you attribute that to? So we're still trying to figure that out. We do know that there 
there's an increase in the amount of fentanyl, which is about 100 times more potent than heroin, that it's really infiltrated the drug supply here in Chicago. Has the COVID pandemic made it harder to respond to this increase? Maybe the increase was happening because of fentanyl. Has it complicated your response efforts in any way? Not our response because one of the ways that we're trying to combat it is increasing the amount of naloxone, which is the medications that's used to reverse opioid overdoses. We're trying to increase the amount of naloxone found in the community. So making sure that everyone that has an opioid use disorder or any drug use disorder or know someone with a drug use disorder, um, making sure that they have that medication on hand. What some of the barriers we've seen is that after those who experience an overdose, they enter the emergency department, but they may not necessarily be discharged with naloxone in hand. So we formed a hospital learning collaborative with many of the hospitals in the city. And we specifically targeted the 10 hospitals that treat the most number of overdoses in the city to make sure they're part of this learning collaborative. And we're looking at ways to make it possible for um, naloxone to be dispensed or given to the patient before they leave the ED. Because right now, I think the common practice is to write a prescription, but it's not necessarily filled after they leave. Got it. I mean, I wonder whether with COVID, people may not be using drugs with other people who could give them naloxone if they overdosed. They might be using, be more likely to use it by themselves. I know um, I've spoken to harm reduction groups and we've also worked to give them a phone number because there are organizations that are available for people who use opioids to call that number before they use. And then someone will call them within a certain amount of time to check in on them. Um, and then if there's no response, that organization will call for help. So that, um, that may be a backup effort. And maybe that's one reason why there's so many calls this year. Well, it sounds like you have a tremendous responsibility and the COVID crisis has made both the mental health and substance use parts of your job even more challenging. Yeah. Um, one thing I am grateful for is that um, with the federal regulations, um, they eased the restrictions on the type of modalities that can be used to provide telehealth services. So they're allowing for um, like WebEx or Zoom, where that wasn't necessarily the case before. And so now when we have street outreach teams trying to reach out to people who use opioids, especially those living in encampments who are homeless, if a referral is needed to link them to some a healthcare provider who could provide the medication um, that can help treat opioid use disorder, the person is immediately linked to the provider, usually on the outreach worker's cell phone. So they don't have to, there's no delay between when the referral is made and when the person is able to go to the clinic and see the provider. Another area that I want to highlight is that we are trying to really encourage this integration of um, behavioral health services with primary care. So a lot of the funding opportunities that we raise, we specifically call for that. So if we're funding like a, a federally qualified health center, basically a clinic that provides primary care services, we ask that they expand their services to include psychiatric care or therapy. If we're funding community mental health center, we ask that they use some of the funds to ensure that they are linked to the, the information is relayed back to their patient's primary care home. Got it. So you're trying to use the levers you have to expand access to treatment. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jasmine. I really appreciate your joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was nice talking to you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you.